You may remember last year, whenever we ceased having Sunday morning Bible class, we were engaged in a study of the life of Christ. We were doing a chronological study of the life of Christ. And I intend for us to pick that study back up next Sunday. But what I'm wanting to do, uh, before we get back actually into that study where we were, I want to do a couple of weeks of review just to kind of bring us back up to where uh, where we had left off, but I do not have those lessons uh, completed in the way that I want them completed just yet. And so this morning we're going to look at a different lesson, but a very important lesson. So bear with me as we get started with our lesson this morning. We're going to end up in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. You may want to mark that page because we're going to look at some other scriptures leading up to this passage. After the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, God began almost immediately to promise that an anointed one, a Messiah, was going to come and that he was going to redeem man back to a righteous state, was going to make it possible for man to once again have the ability to be in a right relationship with God. Throughout the Old Testament, we find God's faithful continually looking for this promised Messiah. Of course, there were times when they lost sight of who the Messiah was going to be. There were times that they fell away from faithfulness. But throughout every age that we saw, throughout the Old Testament, we found those who were faithful to God, who were continuing to look for this promised Messiah. Well, as the time drew closer for the Messiah to come, God realized that the hearts of many of the Jews, in fact, a majority of the Jews, had turned away from a devotion to him. They were no longer looking for a Messiah in the sense that Jesus was going to be. They were looking for something much different. And so he began to send men, we refer to them as the prophets, He began to send men with special messages to the people to help direct their minds, direct their hearts to the type of individual that they needed to be looking for. And the reason that he was doing this was in anticipation of the Messiah to come. He wanted people to already have in the forefront of their mind who they were supposed to be looking for. That way, whenever Jesus did come on the scene, and when he was so much different from what the religious leaders of the day were telling them the Messiah was going to be, then they would be readily accepting of Jesus as this promised Messiah. God stated in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, He says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Notice at this time, they're living under the old covenant, the law of Moses. He said, But there's a time coming that this old covenant's going away. He says that I'm going to establish a new covenant. I'm going to establish this new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, and not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Notice he said it's not going to be uh, based upon the old law. He said it's not going to be based on this covenant. But notice what he also says about their forefathers. He said, I gave them this covenant. I gave them this law when I led them out of Egypt. But notice what he goes on to say. He said, but they broke it. They broke it. They broke that covenant. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This is just one token passage that we find in the prophets that prophesies of the coming of this new covenant. 
a new covenant whereby a spiritual aspect is going to be there. Notice he said he's going to put the law on their inward parts. When we think about the law of Moses, what was something that was so much a part of the law of Moses? The outward. That which was public. You had to publicly go to the temple. You had to publicly bring a sacrifice. You had to publicly pay your temple taxes. You had all of these regulations in place that you had to do that was visible, that was public, that was outward. He said, no, he said, this new law, it's going to be on the inside. It's going to be spiritual. It's going to be based upon the heart. Now, what do the scriptures tell us? The things that's in the heart, what's going to happen? They're going to come forth. The way that we act, the things that we say, the way that we conduct ourselves, it's coming forth because we have the law of Christ in our hearts. But he says this new covenant... It's going to be different from the old covenant. It's not going to be the same as it was before. But then we can also look at prophets such as Isaiah or Joel or Zechariah or a number of others that give us additional information about this new covenant and about the Messiah that was going to come. But what we see, and something that has always been so interesting to me and really amazing to me, is with all the minute details that the prophets set forth about Jesus. Why did people not accept him? Why were there not more people that were ready, that kept that knowledge at heart? And I think the reason that it was was because they weren't listening to God. They were listening to their leaders. They were listening to man and the things that man was telling them. Remember, by the time the first century came around, they were thinking that the Messiah was going to be a military leader. That he was going to come along and he was going to bring them some type of comfort from Rome. But why did they believe that? Because that's what the religious leaders had been telling them. And sadly, we still see that today. So often people put too much trust in man. They put too much trust. And I'm not just talking about it from a spiritual sense. We see those who have been hurt, who have been led astray by man when we look at the spiritual realm. But how many times do we put too much trust in the things of this physical world? We put too much trust in our government. We put too much trust in, um, in those authority figures. How many times does that end up getting us in trouble? A lot of times it does. But if we stay with the Word of God, we believe the things that are contained there, and we apply that to our life, to our reasoning processes, then we're not going to have as much of a difficulty with this. Well, then we come into the opening pages of the New Testament. And we're introduced to a unique individual. And I say unique individual to say the least. John. We're introduced to a man by the name of John who came to be known as the baptizer. Mark chapter 1 reveals to us that John was a forerunner of Christ. He came preaching a doctrine of repentance. The baptism that he was baptizing with was a baptism of repentance. But the purpose of his ministry was to get people's minds back on the truth. Get them back to the right comprehension of who the Messiah was going to be because he knew Jesus was about to come. Remember his message, and I'm sure that that it went much more detailed than this, but the overall thrust of his message was repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is about to be here. You need to get ready. Prepare for it. But John's role was also one that was prophesied. In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. 
Well, then as we come over into the book of Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, John confesses to those who were coming to hear him that he was the fulfillment of this prophecy. That just as Isaiah said that someone was going to come, John was the one who was in the wilderness. You notice John didn't go right into the middle of Jerusalem and find a pool somewhere and start baptizing people there. Where did he go? He went out into the desert, into the wilderness, to the Jordan River. People were traveling great distances to go out and see this man. He says, this is fulfillment of prophecy. John was that promised forerunner. But as Luke 3 and verse 15 tells us, there were still some who didn't quite comprehend what John was up to. Because there were some that started to think, well, maybe this is the Messiah. Even though he was not teaching that, even though he was teaching that the kingdom was at hand, that it was about to come, they started to think, well, maybe John is this promised Messiah. Maybe he's the one that we've been looking for. Well, when they finally asked him, or when they finally confronted him with what they were thinking, and asked him if he was this promised Messiah. In verses 16 and 17, he says, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh. The latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into the garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And you know, Don, something that's very interesting to me. One day later, the very next day, after John made that statement, he looks up and guess who he sees coming. There he is. He's at the Jordan. He's preaching. He's baptizing people. Suddenly he looks up and there's Jesus. And you remember what he cries out? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The very first time that it was revealed to mankind who the Messiah was, was by John the baptizer. All of those gathered on that day heard him say, this man, this is the one that I was telling you about. This is the one that you need to listen to. This very next day. But we being human, even though he said that in a, in a short period of time, as time goes, he, had, he sent one of his disciples to ask this very man, are you the Messiah? And that gets back to what you were saying a while ago about people wanting something different or not knowing or not remembering even. Uh, that's why I think study is so important because Don's right. work forgets. That's right. Yes, very much so. And and you know, at the time, John had begun to hear about all these great things that Jesus was doing, and, and I think part of that also was John knew that he himself could not go to Jesus at that point, but he wanted to go and he wanted to just make absolutely sure for himself that he re- that this really was the Messiah. Now. If we notice what the text tells us, I believe that this proclamation that he made was motivated by the Holy Spirit. It had to be, as Don just said. Because he looked up and he knew immediately when he saw Jesus. You know, nothing in the text tells us that he knew prior to this that Jesus was the Messiah. But when he looked up and he saw Jesus... You know, as this account goes on, we see that all three figures of the Godhead were present on that occasion. I believe that he was motivated by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit moved him to make that proclamation. But as Don mentioned, and I think it's a good observation, it shows us that John was man. That there were still times that he was reasoning with himself and he wanted to make sure that Jesus really was the Messiah. Well, Jesus comes to John. He wants to be baptized. John tells him, you know, he said, I'm the one that needs to be baptized by you. But you've come to me. 
And Jesus tells him that the purpose for that was to fulfill all righteousness. And I think that part of the reason behind that also, and and it may not be a, the, the main thrust, the main reason behind it, but I think part of it also was to help Jesus identify with us. To help him identify with mankind. Because remember, when Jesus was here, yes, he was 100% God, but he was 100% man. And that's what John was telling mankind to do. The message at that point was what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those that were accepting that message were being baptized with a baptism of repentance. Jesus did that because that's what was expected of man at the time. It was to fulfill all righteousness. Well, following Jesus' baptism, we remember that he's led up into the wilderness for 40 days where he's tempted by the devil. He then comes back and he begins his public ministry. And in his teachings, he left no doubt whatsoever as to who he was and what he had come to do. He left no doubt whatsoever that he truly is the Son of God and that he had come to take away the sins of mankind. He stated in John 5 and verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. What had the message of John been? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, the hour is coming and now is. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. In saying this, he was drawing their minds all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. All the way back to the point where sin entered into the lives of man. That time when man fell out of that perfect relationship with God. And throughout his ministry, we see this recurring theme that the kingdom, the kingdom is how we get back into that relationship with God. It's not through works of merit. It's not through being a good person. It's not through going through all the rituals of the old covenant. It's through the kingdom, through the church. Jesus continued through his ministry to teach the importance of this kingdom. Even though, remember, the kingdom did not come into establishment till after Jesus died. He was simply preparing people for that. Getting them ready for the kingdom. Because remember, until he shed his blood, the kingdom could not come into establishment. Without the shedding of blood, there is what? There is no remission of sins. And without the remission of sins, we cannot be added to the kingdom. But Jesus' message throughout his ministry was prepared. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23 says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And then we find him beseeching his followers in a very common passage, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That has to be the foremost thing in our life is seeking first the kingdom. But we find that he even addressed those who would take on the image of a Christian but never really become a Christian, those two-faced individuals. When he made the statement that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. He said, there's going to be some who are going to claim to be in the kingdom. There's going to be some who claim to be doing my will. He said, but unless they're doing the will of God, they're not really a part of the kingdom. This is why as we look at the opening verses of the book of Revelation, we see this image of Jesus pictured as walking among the churches, walking among these candlesticks. And this candlestick is indicative. Now those of you that are here on Wednesday night, pay attention to this because we'll talk about this then as well. Those candlesticks are indicative of their Christian identity. They were identified as congregations of the body of Christ. 
But do you remember what Jesus revealed? He said, if you do not change. These congregations were doing things that were not right. He said, if you do not change. Well, what were they doing? They weren't doing the will of their Father in heaven. He said, if you don't change, he says, I'm going to come along and I'm going to remove that candlestick. You're no longer in my sight going to be considered children of God. Now, does that mean that to the world, they're still not going to be pictured as Christians? Well, no. Look at how many different religious groups there are in the world around us today claiming to be Christian. Look how many congregations there are that wear the title Church of Christ that are not worshiping the way that they should, who are not teaching and practicing the things that they should. Well, if we're interpreting the book of Revelation correctly, they no longer have that candlestick of Christian identity in the eyes of God. And there are going to be some of those, like Jesus talked about on the day of judgment, that are going to be saying, well, did we not prophesy? Did we not do uh, all of these wonderful things in your name? Folks, every religious group on this earth claiming to be Christian does some good things. Some of them do a lot of good things. But what's Jesus going to say to them? Depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because they weren't doing the will of their Father in heaven. If we want to be children of God, if we want to be a part of that kingdom, then we have to stay with the will of God. We can't deviate from that. I had a man tell me the other day, I talked to him about obeying the gospel. I told him what he had to do. He said, no, Don. He said, I don't believe this. I believe if I do good to the best I can, the Lord's going to take care of the rest. I said, that's not what he said. But this man truly believes it. And he's a cousin of mine. You know, so. Yeah. Well, and part of that comes into the discussion of grace. You know, without God's grace, there's not a single one of us going to make it to heaven. But what God does expect of us is to do the best we can in keeping with his will. There are specific things we have to do. That is correct. To inherit or to receive that grace. That's right. God's grace is a free gift, but it's something that we have to do something in order to receive. We don't earn it, but there is a certain procedure that we have to do. That's right. There are certain things we have to do. That's right. Uh, and that does away with this. All you have, I get so aggravated, had a man went to see my uncle just before he died, told him all you have to do is pray to God and you'll be forgiven. And I wasn't able to convince him that that man was lying to him. Yeah. I mean, the whole concept of, of a sinner's prayer is, is to use a literary term, it's an oxymoron. You know, I mean, and, and what that means, it means you, you state something that on the surface doesn't make sense. Because the scriptures, at least in two locations, tell us that God does not hear the prayers of a sinner, does not answer the prayers of a sinner. So if you put the term sinner's prayer in there, what is that accomplishing? It's yeah, not accomplishing how, anything. How does a person who's an alien sinner, how does he approach God? The question's been asked to me. Uh, he, the Lord does the separating. If I pray to him for forgiveness of my sins, sincerely doing that for the purpose of wanting to do his will, he'll hear me. But if I just pray for it and sin to do what I want to do, he'll not hear us. So there is a two-fork stick. Well, and, and let me comment on what Don just said, and then we need to get back to the discussion. We do not have access to the avenue of prayer if we're not children of God. That's the thing that we have to understand from the outset. Until you are children of God, you don't have access to the avenue of prayer. Don made mention of an alien sinner. An alien sinner is someone who is not a child of God who is living in sin. If that person prays to God and asks for God to forgive their sins, they don't have access to the avenue of prayer. They don't have access to God in that way. Only those who are children of God. And the scriptures tell us very plainly 
And you've heard it at the end of every sermon that's probably ever been presented in this pulpit by any man that's ever been here. We have to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have to repent of our sins, meaning we make that decision. We're going to turn away from our sins and we're going to be focused on godly things. We have to confess that faith. We have to be baptized. In baptism, our sins are washed away. But what else happens? We're added to the kingdom. And when we are added to the kingdom, there are things that are made available to us at that point that were not available to us before. God's grace, as we mentioned, is one of them. The avenue of prayer is another. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead because we're getting a little short of time. Let's go ahead and let's move into Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 was an exciting time. Jesus, just a short time before, has been crucified, was laid in the tomb. Three days later, he arose. He spent time during that... uh, intermittent period between the resurrection and the ascension with his apostles. You know what? There's a lot of things that they could have talked about. But what did the scriptures tell us the thrust of their message was about? The kingdom. The kingdom. And the reason that was was because those men were going to be the ones that were going to usher in the church. They were going to be the initial leaders in the church. The Spirit was going to inspire them with the knowledge that they would need in order to do that. But let's begin in verse 1. They were told that they were to remain in Jerusalem. They were not to try to start this kingdom. They were not to go out preaching. They were to stay in Jerusalem until the kingdom came with power. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now after this initial receipt of power, which is what we find described as the baptism or the complete immersion with the Holy Spirit. We find that these apostles, notice that it says that they began to speak with other tongues. Well, following this, Peter stood up with the eleven. Remember, Judas has gone out. He's taken his own life. There's been another man that has been chosen to take his place, a man by the name of Matthias. They go out. There's a lot of people in Jerusalem at this time. They're there for this feast, the day of Pentecost. They stand up and they began to preach. Peter's message is one that is recorded for us. We commonly refer to it as the first gospel sermon. And as he preached the lesson on that day, he convicted the hearts of those that were there. That they were guilty of crucifying Jesus. They were guilty of crucifying the Son of God. Well, as he was still preaching, folks, I've never had this happen before. Don, you may have. But as he was still preaching, they stopped him right in the middle. They said, what are we supposed to do then? We're convicted. They're pricked to the heart. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? They wanted to know right then and there. Tell us what we need to do. You remember his message on that day was to repent and be baptized. Those that gladly received the word were baptized on that day. And about 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. But I want to skip down and I want us to look beginning in verse 42. Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 42. And what we're going to see is this newborn church. The way that they conducted themselves. The way that they treated one another. Their day-to-day activities. It says, And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' doctrine and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place 
through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There's a few things that we see from these verses that I want to point out just briefly as we bring this lesson to a close. Folks, first off, we see that these early Christians, they were convicted. They were devoted to their faith, or as we might even say today, they were addicted to their faith. They had made a complete turn from their old way of life, and they weren't going to turn back. But what was it that they were addicted to? They were addicted to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to learn everything that they could about their newfound faith. They continued in fellowship with each other. They broke bread together. Now, in this sense, it's not take, talking about partaking the Lord's Supper. This is talking about they were together. They enjoyed meals together. They uh, spent time together. But then it says that they were devoted to prayer. They were a prayerful people. But the reason that they were doing all of this was, folks, they were in awe of what they were witnessing. They were in awe of the things that they were hearing and the miracles that were being performed. And so what did they do? They took care of each other. If there was someone that was in need, they were, they were even willing to sell their possessions to provide for one another. They became true disciples, true followers of Christ. And they were happy. They were happy. As children of God, we should be the happiest people on this earth. And they found favor with all the people, not just with their brothers and sisters, but with everyone. They found favor with all the people, and that congregation grew. The church grew because the Lord was adding to the church daily.